Get ready to embark on a week-long sourdough adventure with me. Imagine waking up to the aroma of freshly baked sourdough creations from warm and crusty artisan loaves to fluffy golden waffles. Join me as I share a week of sourdough recipes that will transform your breakfasts, lunches, and snacks. Hi friends, I'm Petrina with Homegrown Florida and I am addicted to sourdough bread. Well, sourdough anything. <laughs> It started out that I just wanted to make my own artisan loaf, but once I got started, I quickly figured out that you can pretty much make anything with sourdough. And so I did. <laughs> sourdough has an amazing flavor. It has really good health benefits. It's easier to digest, and it has a minimum amount of ingredients. Probably things you already have around your house. But before we jump into these recipes, let me tell you what every good sourdough recipe starts with, and that's a sourdough starter. I named mine Elizabeth back when I created her in 2021. It's kind of a thing that we do as sourdough makers. We name our starter. I did create her with just water, flour, and a little bit of thyme. That's really all you need. I will warn you that creating your own is a bit of a lengthy process. Elizabeth here took 24 days. That's 24 days of feeding her and taking care of her. I have a whole other video that I'll add down into the description on how to create your own, if that's something that you might be interested in. <laughs> but there is another way if you don't wanna go through that whole process, you could buy your own sourdough starter. So places like Etsy and Facebook marketplaces are great places to start. If you have a bakery near your home, give them a call and see if they'll sell you some of theirs. Or even better, reach out to your local community groups on Facebook to see if anyone is willing to share some of their starter with you. The sourdough community is very supportive and I've seen plenty of neighbors giving it out for free, including myself. I've, I've probably given Elizabeth to several of my neighbors and friends. <laughs> Once you have your starter, then you can get started. If maintaining a starter is not something you are interested in, you can use active dry yeast for these recipes, but be aware that the rise time will be much shorter. <laughs> sourdough is much longer. Now let's get started. We're gonna be making an artisan crusty sourdough loaf, everything seasoned bagels, fluffy sweet waffles, and some ranch flavored crackers. The first thing I'm gonna do is actually figure out how I'm gonna build up my starter now. You don't have to do this, but I like to keep a starter that is very minimal. And so lots of people keep starters, you know, somewhere around, you know, 60 to 90 grams. And I keep about five grams. <laughs> I keep a very small amount of starter. And the reason I do this is because I go by a uh, no waste method of my sourdough. And basically this just means that when I discard, I'm almost never discarding and throwing away. So a lot of the times, the only thing that I discard is things that I'm going to end up baking with. So nothing gets thrown away, nothing gets accumulated, those kinds of things. So the way that I do that is I write down what my recipe is going to require in terms of starter. So if it needs 90 grams, I write down 90. And then I weigh my starter with my scale. So I started with about 30 grams of starter once I weighed it out. I guess mine had gotten a little heavy over the last couple days. And so I need my starter to at least equal 90 plus more left over so that I can continue to keep it alive. You don't wanna use all your starter up because then you won't have it for the future. So I'm gonna do 30 grams of starter and then I'm gonna do 40 grams of water and 40 grams of flour. Now the water that I'm using is bottled water. And the reason for that is my starter is still very young. And, and by very young, I mean it's almost uh, it's almost two years old at this point, but that's quite young for a starter. <laughs> Some people keep starters for 30 or 40 years, which is just insane. It's, it's pretty crazy. Because mine is so young, it doesn't handle change very well. <laughs> so if I were to use a different water, like my tap water that has high levels of chlorine, as well as I have a water softener in my house which has salt in it and it kind of purifies the water it would possibly kill my starter and i have noticed that it's never actually killed my starter when i used it but it has 
slowed it down significantly. So when I'm making a recipe or when I'm building up my starter, I will use bottled water. We also have well water that I could use, um, but I didn't want to go through the effort of pulling the water out of the well. Now, if you are going to use city water, it does have chlorine in it. And so the best way to dissipate that chlorine is to leave the water in an open container with no top on your kitchen countertop and let it dissipate for 24 hours and then it will be fine in your starter. So here is where I'm showing that my little calculation, my 30 grams of starter, my 36 grams of water, and my 38 grams of flour is gonna bring us to 104 grams total, 90 for the recipe, 14 remaining for uh, to keep my starter going. It took my starter about, I think it was like five hours to double in size. And so once it doubles in size, it's ready to go. You don't have to wait for it to like triple or quadruple in size. Once it has hit that double size, you can go ahead and move on with your recipe. So I'm weighing out here with my kitchen scale, the 90 grams of starter I need for the artisan loaf. Now I'm gonna be adding the water for the recipe, which is 385 grams of water. Um, this recipe also calls for 520 grams of flour, specifically unbleached bread flour. I, I always use bread flour whenever I'm making an artisan loaf. It is the best <laughs> flour to use for these loaves and for bread making. It just adds that fluffier, lighter texture that you're looking for in a bread. And then don't forget, I have done this before, do not forget the 12 grams of sea salt or any kind of salt. I use iodized salt. Um, some people prefer you know, like a pink Himalayan salt or a Redmond's real salt or something like that. But w do not forget the salt because I did that once and the bread tastes very weird. <laughs> it's funny because when you eat bread, you don't think that it actually has a salty taste. But if you leave out the salt, it's very, very obvious that there is something missing in that bread. <laughs> Um, so now we're just going to mix it up and it's going to take a little while to get this all mixed together. It is kind of a really sticky dough at this point. Um, so I'm going to first start with my fork, but then I'm going to start kneading it with my hands. And this is a really a no need recipe, but I just kind of like kneading. I think it's just kind of fun. But if you don't want to knead, it's no big deal. Just um, mix it until there's no more dry flour left and um, then you can just cover the bowl and wait about 30 minutes and then you're gonna do three rounds of what's called a stretch and fold and it's just, what you're trying to do is build up the gluten and the way that you do that is by stretching the bread out so that the gluten fibers, I think, get longer and it's gonna create uh, the ability for the bread to rise better. So that's what you're doing is just kind of pulling it apart. Now I have done this many different ways and you can see there was a stretch and fold that I was doing, which is the traditional way, but my bread gets really tight, <laughs> all my dough does. So I move on to this other method where I actually use both my hands and pull it out of the bowl and kind of stretch it apart and then fold it back in on itself. The reason I even started making my own sourdough bread was actually because I used to get this one type of loaf of bread from Winn-Dixie. It was a sourdough rosemary artisan loaf and it was already like cut up and everything and it was my absolute favorite bread to put spinach dip on and I'm kind of addicted to a very garlic spinach dip that I make and it really was the only bread that I felt was like really good with the spinach dip because it has its own flavor. It has that crusty outside, that soft inside and so I have been craving that and unfortunately the Winn-Dixie by my house no longer makes it. <laughs> so uh, being as I really was craving it for months uh, I figured I would make my own sourdough bread. <laughs> and that's what started this whole thing. You can see how um, stubborn I can be <laughs> or how persistent. Let's use persistent, not stubborn. I'm very persistent. And when I couldn't get that bread anymore, I thought, well, I'm gonna figure out how to make it. And this was a process that took a very long time since Elizabeth does take 24 days to create. And then sourdough bread in and of itself takes quite a bit of time too. It's usually, you know, a day and a half process. Now, there's not a lot of hands-on time 
Um, there is just the mixing of the dough and then what you see right here, what we're doing by the stretches and folds um, that we do three times, 30 minutes apart. It does take a lot of time. <laughs> so now we're just gonna cover the bowl up and we're going to leave this bread out on our counter for mm, anywhere from eight to 12 hours. And that's going to allow what's called the bulk fermentation stage. And it's going to allow that dough to rise and to create that puffy dough. Now this dough is what happened the next morning. And uh, unfortunately I kind of slept in and so it has overproofed because it really should only double in size. And you can see mine looks like it probably tripled. So it is way overproofed. Now this happens to me a lot because I like my sleep. And so because I like my sleep and it's proofing overnight, it, especially during the summer when, you know, the house is just a little bit warmer than it is during the winter. During the winter, you know, my oversleeping time doesn't seem to be a problem for the sourdough. But as you can see here, it's very sticky. It's not holding a form, which if you've ever watched sourdough videos out there in the, the YouTube world or Instagram, it holds a form and mine typically doesn't because I do let it bulk ferment for probably much longer. But this is this, this technique that I do to get my bread to build tension since it was kind of soft and uh, sticky and not really holding a shape. Um, I do this kind of spin move here with my uh, dough cutter as well as with my hands to try to create tension so that it holds its own shape. And then once I've done this a few times, I'm going to flip it into a floured banneton and it's just, it's not any type of flour. I use rice flour. If you don't want to go out and buy rice flour, just take some rice and actually blend it in like your blender or your food processor or a coffee bean grinder, any of those things will create rice flour if you don't want to buy a whole expensive pack of rice flour. We're going to stick it in the fridge now because I was not ready to bake at that moment. But if you are ready, you don't have to do the fridge step. You can just go ahead and move forward. But I always find that whenever I'm making an artisan loaf, putting it in the fridge, especially when I've overproofed it, does help it uh, get cold and it gets harder so that that way it's not like, you know, pouring out of the bowl. You're going to stick your Dutch oven in the oven for an hour at 500 degrees. It's very hot, but you want that Dutch oven to heat up really, really high. While it's heating up, when you're getting close to the one hour mark, we're going to flip our dough out of the banneton. If you don't have a banneton, just use a glass bowl. It's or any bowl really, you don't have to use a banneton or a glass bowl, and you're gonna score it and maybe make any kind of pretty design that you want. I haven't quite gotten the trick to making the pretty design, so my bread is not really beautiful yet, uh, but the scoring is really important so that that way the bread doesn't kinda break apart at whatever seam it wants, or in this particular case, if I hadn't scored it, it would not have gotten the rise that it has gotten because what it does is, is it pushes out steam once that cold bread hits that hot Dutch oven and that heat and steam is what actually causes this bread to rise. Being as I overproofed it, it really needs all the help it can get to rise up. And so the scoring is super important here. So I'm just gonna take that sourdough bread that's on the parchment paper and I'm gonna pop it into the Dutch oven and then that's gonna go into a 500 degree oven for about 25 minutes. After the 25 minutes, we're gonna take it out and I like to test the temperature of my bread. Now, you don't have to do this. Lots of times the 25 minutes should be plenty, but this is gonna tell you uh, whether your bread is really done on the inside, especially if you overproof it like what I did. What you're looking for is somewhere between 190 and 205 degrees. As long as you're hitting that, you can go ahead and move on to the next step. But if you're not hitting that, you're just gonna put the Dutch oven lid back on and stick it in the oven. Mine was at, I think, right at 200. So I took the top off the Dutch oven. And now what we're gonna do is reduce the temperature down to 450. And you can let this sit in here for five minutes or you can let it sit in here for 20 minutes. It really depends on how dark you want the crust of your bread. We like ours to be a softer crust. We don't like the super crunchy crust. 
So we only do five minutes at the 450. And as you can see here, I did get a little bit more rise. I got more rise than I actually expected for being a overproofed dough. Um, we did eat it and it was amazing. I actually couldn't tell that I overproofed it. <laughs> so if you get your sourdough dough out of the uh, banneton or out of your bowl after proofing and you realize that you've overproofed it, still bake it. Always bake it because the worst that's going to happen is it's going to be a flat bread and then maybe you can make croutons with it. But you could get lucky like what I do every single time and it will actually rise and create an ear and it will be delicious. Next recipe we're going to work on is everything bagels. One of my absolute favorite sourdough recipes to make. So once again, we're going to be building up our starter. This recipe actually calls for 150 grams of active starter. So we're going to build it up quite a bit. Because I had so little amount of starter left, which was only 14 grams, and I need 150 to get to where I want for this recipe, plus more so that I can save off. So I need to get up to 160 grams of starter. I'm going to use my water and I'm going to shake it up with the, you know, 14 grams of starter that's in there, which isn't a lot, which is going to help make sure that I collect any starter that's kind of stuck to the side of the glass. And by shaking it, that is like the easiest way to try to collect as much of the discarded starter that's in the jar. And then I'm going to be adding 80 grams of water and 80 grams of all-purpose flour, unbleached all-purpose flour, which is super important not to use bleached. It's better to use unbleached. Um, bleached may cause it not to rise. Now, because I'm adding so much and this jar is not super big, I am going to have to put this in a bowl because my jar could overfill and I'm also not screwing that cap on tight. It's actually super, super loose. Thankfully, my starter is not like super active. So it did double in about 12 hours. And, and I wanted to preface that, that a lot of recipes say that your starter should double in six hours. But when you are increasing it like I do, where I'm going from 14 grams to 150 grams, it is not going to do that in six hours. <laughs> Mine took overnight. It took 12 hours and that is completely normal because you're building that starter up from a very small, um, a small weight. So here we are, we're getting ready to make the actual dough for the bagels. And that dough has that 150 grams of starter. And then we're going to add 250 grams of water. 24 grams of sugar, 9 grams of salt, and then 500 grams of bread flour. So once again, we're using bread flour for this recipe, just like we did with the artisan loaf. As a kid growing up, I never really liked bagels. <laughs> I think this is because I'm not really a breakfast person because I feel like breakfast is always about sweets and I do love sweets, but I don't like sweets first in the morning. And bagels have always been something that was always sweet. We always had like a cinnamon raisin bagel or a cranberry bagel or something like that with these sweet cream cheeses. And for me, I just don't like sweet stuff in the morning. But once I came across a everything bagel with like a garlic cream cheese. Oh my gosh, I've been addicted ever since. So now that I have a savory bagel recipe, I make these all the time. I absolutely love them. And that's another really cool thing about making your own bread products with your sourdough starter is you can make these however you want. So if you like the sweet ones, you could add raisins and cinnamon to the dough so that that way you get like a, a sweet bagel or you could add cranberries or you could add maple syrup. You can add all kinds of stuff to make it however you want in the quantity that you like. So maybe you don't like super sweet, but you want a little bit sweet. So you add less or maybe you like it just crazy sweet <laughs> and then you can add more sugar and um, more fruit to it. You can make it however you like, which I absolutely love about bread making. Now that we have all the ingredients together, we're going to knead this dough. This is a very, very dry dough. You're going to see in a little bit why it's so important that this actually is a pretty dry dough, but it's a little hard in the beginning 
to get it to combine together. So you see, I'm, I'm really working, I'm grabbing that flour on the bottom of the bowl and kind of pushing it and kneading it into the dough so that it gets all that flour together. But it's, it's very rough, <laughs> it's very tight. Now it shouldn't be dry and um, like brittle. It should, the flour shouldn't be pulling away. It should still stick to itself, but it's going to be super hard. Think like Play-Doh that was left out for a long period of time. It's gonna be that kind of hard. Now that we have it all mixed together, we're gonna to cover it with some plastic wrap and we are also gonna set this one out overnight as well. Because this one is so dense, it doesn't double or overproof like the artisan loaf does. So setting it out all night long was fine. I woke up in the morning and I moved it to the fridge because I wasn't quite ready to use it. If you were ready to use it, you would not have to, to do this step. But you can see here that it, it doubled um, only barely. <laughs> and you can see it's very hard. It's still got that Play-Doh consistency, which is perfect. And I'm just using my hands to kind of spread it into as much of a rectangle or a circle as I possibly can, because now what I need to do is cut this into eight pieces. So I'm gonna cut this dough in half and then in quarters, and then I'm gonna split those in half as well to create that eight count. So the way that I make the rolls with them, and I do this with my regular, I make a, a garlic and cheese stuffed roll um, in the same way that I'm making these bagels, which is you're just going to take those little pizza slices <laughs> or those little triangles and you're gonna fold them into themselves, into the center, and then use your fingers to kind of push it into a circle shape. And then you have that seam on the bottom there that you're trying to kind of rub out. So I just roll it on the counter and then I start doing this action where I kind of push using the counter as to create some tension to get it to make that you know, circle shape or that oval shape. Once you have it into that shape, you're gonna set it on a tray and let it rest for about 30 minutes. Now I'm gonna be creating the actual bagel shape. And all I do to do this is I, I lift up the little roll and I kind of stick my fingers and my thumbs through the center and then I roll it in my fingers. I roll it kind of pinwheel style so that that way it opens up a center hole. Now as they sit for their next rise, which is only about 20 minutes, they're going to shrink a little bit. You can already see that first one that I made is already starting to shrink a little bit. That's fine. It's no big deal. If you really like the center hole to be wider, you just need to do that pinwheel shape a little bit longer. While that's happening, I'm going to pour the everything seasoning into a little bowl, just so I have it ready. And then I'm gonna bring the bagels over to a simmering pot of water, semi-boiling simmering pot of water. You want to boil your bagels before you actually bake them because the boiling process is what makes the bagels chewy. And you want chewy bagels. You don't want like a bread bagel. So it's only 30 seconds on each side. So it's just 30 seconds when you put them in and then you take your spoon and flip them over and do another 30 seconds. Then all you have to do is take them out of the water and set them back on your tray Give them about a minute or two to cool down enough that you can touch them. And at that point, that's when you're going to dip the top into your bowl of seasoning, whatever seasoning you're using. I'm using the everything seasoning and then um, put them back on the tray. Because the dough is wet and sticky at this point from being boiled, it really holds on to the seasoning super easy. So it's, it's not anything special that you have to do here other than just dip them in there and place them back on the tray. Once you've done that with all of your bagels, then it's time to bake them. You're gonna preheat your oven to 425. Then you're going to place your bagels in the oven for 20 to 25 minutes. Now mine took a little bit longer. I think they ended up going for 30 minutes. And what you're looking for is for the bagels to be brown on the bottom and kind of crispy on the top. Not super crispy, but a little bit crispy and you should see some browning on the edges of those bagels. Perfect everything bagels. I freeze these and then we just take them out one at a time, let them defrost on the counter for about 10 minutes and then put them in the toaster and they are perfect. 
Now the next two recipes that we're going to be making, one is the waffles, the sweet waffles. These guys are actual discard recipes. <laughs> Let me tell you the difference between discard and starter. The only difference between discard and starter is that discard is unfed starter. So you don't have to wait for it to rise, but any discard recipe can, you can use a fed starter or you can use an unfed starter. It doesn't matter. But if you're making a recipe where you're looking for things to puff up and rise, that's when you want to use a fed starter. When people talk about discard, a lot of the times it can get a little confusing because they, they think that discard is not starter, but discard actually is starter. It's just starter that hasn't been fed. If you feed it, it becomes starter again. It took me so long to figure that out. And once I figured that out, it, it has really been smooth sailing with baking. <laughs> it's been so much easier. So for our waffles, we're starting with one cup starter. Now this recipe that I have is not in grams. I'm used to getting recipes in grams. So unfortunately, when I was making these waffles, I did not have quite enough starter, but it was fine. I had probably three fourths a cup of starter versus one full cup. Then we're gonna add two cups of flour. I'm using bread flour this time because I have an excess amount of it and not as much um, all-purpose flour, but you could use all-purpose flour, bread flour, pretty much whatever flour you have. We're also gonna do two cups of almond milk and two teaspoons of apple cider vinegar and then two tablespoons of sugar. So I'm mixing up the dry ingredients first, and then I'm going to be adding the almond milk. You can use regular milk or almond milk, whatever you have, and the two teaspoons of apple cider vinegar I mix together and I set it aside for about 30 minutes. That's what creates buttermilk. <laughs> in case you don't have buttermilk in the house, which I never do, this is how I create buttermilk. It's just vinegar and uh, milk mixed together and allowed to sit for a little bit to ferment, basically is what's happening. Once that has happened, I put my starter and my milk in with my dry ingredients and you're gonna notice that this dough is super, super wet. <laughs> After we've mixed it, we're gonna let this dough sit on the counter and ferment overnight. Now, because this is a discard recipe, you don't have to let it sit overnight, but I like to do that to really get the improved health benefits and that sourdough flavor. The longer it ferments, the more sourdough it's going to taste. So I'm just gonna wrap this in plastic wrap and set it on my counter overnight. I understand that there's milk in this and some people might be concerned with leaving milk overnight, but trust me, Sourdough is fermented. It has good bacteria in it that is actually preserving the yeast. And so when you mix it with the milk, it's preserving the milk as well. But if you're uncomfortable with that, by all means, just go ahead and make your waffles right away versus letting it ferment overnight. Once we get to the morning time, I'm going to be adding a half a teaspoon of salt, a half a teaspoon of baking soda, and two room temperature eggs. I'm gonna grease the waffle iron a little bit. I just spritz it with a little bit of avocado oil. You can use olive oil, whatever you have, butter, anything. And then I'm going to put a half a cup of the mixture into the waffle iron. Now my trick with waffles is my waffle iron will tell me that it is ready a little bit too soon because my waffles end up not being crispy. So I always count an additional 30 seconds or even a minute to make sure that my waffles are crispy. Because if I were to go off of what, you know, the waffle iron says, <laughs> they would be just kind of limp and soft. So if I allow them to go 30 seconds more, then I end up with a crispy waffle. This ended up making, I believe, eight or nine large size waffles here. We both had one for breakfast. It was quite big. I mean, they're big waffles, so it was a big breakfast for us. And then we took the remaining six waffles and we froze them. And just like with the bagels, when we wanna have waffles, we'll just take them out of the freezer, set them on the counter, and go finish getting ready for the morning, go brush our teas, do whatever we need to do. And then we'll, by that point, it has defrosted enough to put it into the toaster. And by toasting it, the waffles get crispy again, which is awesome. They, they taste just like when you make them, which is crazy. Now this next recipe is a recipe that I am making for the first time 
Uh, I wanted to do this with you guys because I wanted to show you that not all recipes turn out right, especially, especially sourdough recipes. They never come out right the first time unless you get like super, super lucky. Um, I always have to make adjustments and write down what I've done to change it in order to move towards the appropriate recipe or the better recipe. It doesn't matter how many recipes I've tried, they never work the first time. And I've, I have been doing these recipes for a year now. And so everybody's kitchen is different. Everybody's temperatures in their house is different. The different flours that you use, the different waters that you use, and that all affects your dough. And that is really what's going to affect the end product here. And that's what happened with my crackers. These are a ranch cracker um, and what ended up happening to me was that they turned into, the center of them turned more into like a tortilla versus a cracker. The edges was more like a cracker, but the inside was more like a tortilla. So to me, this tells me that the cracker was not wet enough and it didn't have enough starter. So I had started with a half cup of starter. I would probably move this up to a full cup of starter and the other thing that I would do is this called for half a stick of butter, but I think in the future I'm going to use a full stick because I feel like a full stick of butter would cause it to brown better and get more crispy. You could also probably do this with milk, so maybe I could add a little bit more milk and that would also help it crisp up. Additionally, rolling it out super, super thin, like I thought I rolled it out thin, but it really needs to be even thinner than that. I'm adding one cup and three fourths of flour. And this time I'm using an all purpose flour. And then I'm gonna do one teaspoon of salt and one tablespoon of this homemade ranch powder that I make. You could use the Hidden Valley ranch powder too, or honestly, any other seasoning you want. Like I thought about doing a dehydrated tomato powder. So the, the tomatoes that I'm growing, I want to dehydrate some of them, make it into a powder and mix that with basil and make like a tomato basil cracker. Cause I think that would be amazing. But I wanted to start with something easy and ranch powder is super easy. And it really did taste good. If only I could get the texture right on the cracker. The dough was very dry and very similar to the dough of the bagel, but it was brittle. Um, it was brittle and dry, almost too much. That's why I wanna add more liquid. I wanna add more starter and I wanna add more butter because I feel like if those two things added enough moisture to the dough, it may have rolled out better and it may have created a more thinner, crispier cracker. And I kind of knew it here. You can see I'm, I'm messing with the dough a lot and I'm kind of like in my hands, like trying to form it. And I'm like, something's not right here. This doesn't feel right. And as you move along your sourdough journey, you're going to realize those things. But sometimes you don't know how to correct it, right? I wasn't exactly sure how to correct it because I didn't know how it was going to turn out and I didn't want to deviate too far from the recipe. So I always just kind of go with whatever the recipe says and not try to change it too much the first time because you might get it right the first time. Um, and then I just make small incremental changes. Like the next time I'm probably just going to add more starter and see how it goes. And then if that still doesn't work, then I'll add more butter and see how that works. And if that doesn't work, then I'll add more milk. You know, I'll just keep making one adjustment at a time to figure out what it is that's going to make it the perfect cracker for us. I'm rolling it out on a piece of parchment paper because by the time this is completely rolled out, it's going to be so thin that I'm not going to be able to lift it from my counter. So having it already on a piece of parchment paper, while it's a little bit of a pain in the butt to roll it out like this, it will help moving it to the cookie sheet. Another thing I would do differently next time is I would split this dough in half or in thirds and roll it out individually because I feel like I could make it thinner if it had, you know, more than one section. It means I'd have to bake it, you know, two or three times, but I could make it a lot thinner if it was a smaller amount. 
Roll this out as absolute thin as you possibly can. And when you think you've gotten it as thin as you can, let it rest for about 10 more minutes or 20 minutes and roll it out some more. Roll it out to the point that it's almost like it's starting to break apart. <laughs> you want this so crazy thin. I underestimated how thin that a cracker needs to be rolled out. So if you think that it's thin enough, keep going. It's not thin enough. It needs to be see-through thin. And then we're gonna bake it in a 350 degree oven for anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. You're looking for the edge of the cracker to be crispy. Once we have that browning occurring and that crispness occurring on the edge of the cracker, then you're gonna take it out and allow it to cool to room temperature and then break it apart with your fingers. You could, uh, you know, before you put it in the oven, you could use like a pizza roller to cut it into a shape that you like, but I don't mind the rustic cracker look. I think it's still pretty cute. Thanks so much for spending the week with me making these sourdough recipes. If you're interested in more sourdough recipes, I'll add my non video, which is great for making pitas or individual pizzas, specifically my Caesar salad pizza. I hope you enjoyed this video. Happy baking.